those of you who are watching this on Live Gate Outreach TV or listening to the podcasts, I want to, in Boss Sprouts or in the podcast, I want to say God bless you and uh, may God continue to increase you on every side in Jesus' name. We have been on a series on uh, the quickening power of the Spirit, the quickening power of the Spirit. And today is the third in the series, which is simply titled Enjoying the Quickening Power, uh, sorry, Enjoying the Quickened Body. Enjoying the Quickened Body. As you can see in the um, banner that's been projected, uh, this is the third, and we started with Enjoying the Quickened Spirit last week, Enjoying the Quickened Soul. Because man is a tripartite being, like we have heard over and over again, we have heard that uh, man is a spirit, he has a soul, and he lives in a body. And so I want to encourage you to continue to uh, dig into these messages. If you haven't, if you have missed the first two by any reason, please go to the LiveGate Outreach TV on YouTube, you'll find them there, or you just go to... um, Podcasts, okay? You will find us on LiveGate Outreach Center, and you can see our podcast right back, I think, to 2017. All the messages every Sunday have been put there, and um, on LiveGate Outreach TV for much longer. So you can always follow these series and revisit them by the grace of God. I want to just say that I will need to crave your indulgence today. Time has far gone, but I want to simply say that every, t- every minute we'll spend today will be a blessing. I say it will be a blessing. So I want to take my time. I was going to rush through it and just so that we keep our time. But you know what? Let's give God what he deserves. Amen. Um, There is something about the word of God that I like. When you encounter it, it leaves you never the same. And I know that God will surely leave you never the same today. In the name of Jesus. We want to thank God because the, this, this series has been focused on Romans chapter 8, verse 11, where the Bible says, But if the spirit of him who raised him from the dead, who raised Jesus from the dead, dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. On a day like this, in the... Christian calendar, we celebrate what we call the Palm Sunday today. And uh, it's a tradition that has impacted us for many years. And I just want to encourage you to understand that whilst we may not call those Sundays and name them the way they are, they have a significance. When Jesus rode into Jerusalem and they were shouting, Hosanna to the king who comes in the name of the Lord, he was going in there for the biggest assignment of his ministry. As a matter of fact, he was going in just for the purpose for which he came. The Bible says for this purpose was the Son of God manifest to destroy the works of the evil one. But he wasn't going to use clubs and swords and knives. He was going to use his own blood. The Bible says for the life of a thing is in the blood. The life is in the blood. So he had to use his blood to give us the abundant life that was going to supersede the wicked Ness in the life that uh, people were experiencing. John chapter 10, verse 10. He said, the devil has come to steal, to kill, and to destroy people. But he has come to give life and give it more abundantly. So when he rode into Jerusalem, what he was simply doing was giving a symbol, fulfilling prophecy, but also giving a symbol to what he actually came to do. And when the people welcomed him, it gives us an opportunity to understand that we must always welcome the doings of God in our lives through the gift of Jesus Christ's death and resurrection. Now, when Paul wrote this letter to the Corinthians, Christ has already come. He had already risen. And even though Paul was not one of those who were immediately around him, in Acts chapter 9, Jesus appeared to Paul, who was named Saul at that time, and he gave him this assignment. He said, I'm sending you and you will go and be a light. And when Paul went on, the Bible says he was writing these letters to all these churches. And when he wrote to the Romans, he had this revelation. And he said, look, there is a spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. And he knows that that spirit is also in you and I. He said, if that spirit dwells in you, then that same spirit who raised Christ from the dead is able to quicken or give life or revive your own mortal body. 
So we looked at how it revives us in the spirit, how it revives us in the soul, and how it revives us as we are looking today in the body. So it's God's desire that man is completely sanctified or renewed in God's image. Amen. Amen. It is God's desire that man is completely sanctified and renewed in God's image. One of the scriptures we have been reading for the past few weeks is um, the past few Sundays is the, the verse in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23 and 24. The Bible says, let's read together. Now, are you, are you seeing with me? Yep. Now, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 24. Let's read that together. He said, he who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. So God wants you and I to be sanctified, spirit, soul, and body. He wants us to be preserved, blameless, spirit, soul, and body. And this is simply, it's very simple to understand this. If the spirit of man, like we have looked at two weeks ago, is sanctified, is saved, and is delivered, he has assurance of heaven. He has abundant life. He has the newness of life. But if his soul is not delivered, his mind will continually be tormented by the things that would affect his emotion, that would affect his state of mind, that would bring sadness and sorrow, anxieties, cares of this world. Such a person cannot live, the, cannot live a fulfilled life, even though when, if they die at that point, they still go to heaven because they are saved. So but God doesn't want you to live that way. Now, if a person has a good mind who, who is a spirit is saved and he has, a, he has a, a will that is always wanting to do the will of God, he has emotions that are yielded to the fruit of the spirit, they are, he's full of love, he's full of joy, he's full of peace, he's full of all those things, gentleness, he's kind, and he's just li really living as God desires his children to live. But if his body is not sanctified, he's still exposed to an aspect of the devil that the devil can make and used to give the person a very difficult life. And this is why he wants us to be sanctified completely, spirit, soul, and body. When we talk about the body of man, I want us to know that we're looking at it in two ways. When we talk about the body, the scripture uses body and it uses flesh interchangeably. Every time you read a scripture, if it says spirit, if it says heart, if it says flesh, if it says body, you must understand the context they don't always all mean the same thing. At times, spirit can mean soul, if you read it very well. At times, heart can mean spirit. You get what I'm talking about? Ha Praise the Lord. Do you understand what I'm talking about? So when it talks about these things, you must understand. So when you read it, you must understand. As we will see one scripture today that talks about spirit, but it was actually referring to soul. And we can see it right there in the verse. And when he talks about flesh and body, we must also understand we have to always see it in the context of the physical body and also the spiritual flesh. Somebody will say, but how can the flesh be spiritual? There is an aspect of the body that is not so much of the skin that you can see or the physical that you can see. It is the body, but it is the life in the body. It is the spirit of the body. And I will explain those two things. Those areas of the body, like we looked at the soul, saying that it has a three component of uh, willpower, intellect, and emotions, the same way our body has the two components of the physical being and the spiritual state, which we usually refer to as the flesh much more. Praise the Lord. Now we're going to go back into our scripture reading that we read earlier from Matthew chapter 26. And I'm just going to pick, I'm not going to read everything again. Pastor Keith read it very well, and I believe we all followed it excellently that time. And I'm just going to pick a couple of verses for us so that we can look at how these two aspects of our body can easily be explained from that scripture alone. When we talk about the physical earthly body, we're talking about the dwelling of the spirit, the soul of man, the spirit and the soul of man. So when you look at a person, what you see is their physical body. Praise the Lord. So that is a body that was made from dust, and it is going back to dust. It is come from dust, and it is going back to dust. But we must also understand that because it is so natural, 
It is so susceptible to the enemy. It is the part of the being of a person that the enemy can plant infirmities, sicknesses. This is the part of the being of a person that the enemy can put physical limitations like tiredness and weariness. How many people have been in a situation where you just wanted to get up and you felt so heavy? The spirit man wanted to say, let's go out now and do this thing. But then here is the body. To move one hand is making, making you feel like you are moving a truck. Because the body can be weakened. It can be weakened by the forces of the environment. It can be weakened by the forces of evil. Manipulating the environment. Putting things that make it heavy and difficult. So we must know how God helps us to have a quickened body to overcome in such circumstances of physical weakness and physical sicknesses. Now, this is what happened in Matthew chapter 26. For those of you listening to this on uh, our podcasts or video, we read Matthew chapter 26, verse 36 to 56 in our scripture reading, so you can get the context better. But I want to read now verse 40. Matthew 26, verse 40. The Bible says, Then he came to his disciples, and he found them what? Sleeping. And he said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Could you not watch with me just one hour? And verse 41. The Bible says, let's read verse 41 together. Everyone to go now. Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now look at that. That is why I say at times the word spirit can mean soul. We said last week that the soul of man is where the willpower is. So this word spirit here is not referring to the spirit of man that is regenerated at new birth. It's talking about his soul that needs to continue to be transforming, uh, transformed continually according to Romans chapter 8. The, 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 the spirit of man that needs to be transformed in Romans chapter 12, the mind of man, verse 2, that needs to be transformed continually. Now, it is very important for us to understand that when the spirit is willing, when the Bible says the spirit is willing, is referring to the Greek word pneuma, which simply talks about the soul or the mind of man, where the willpower is. Even though the willpower was there, that is what got them to the foot of the mountain with Jesus. If they didn't want to pray, if they didn't want to go with him, they would not have will to follow him. They did not have to follow him. Where was Thomas? Where was Bartholomew? Where was Nathaniel? And all the others. Those were not willing. But these three were willing. So they got there. So the spirit was willing. Their mind was willing. And this is where we must understand that a willing mind is not sufficient for us to rest our oars. When you have a willing mind, you must know how to engage the Holy Spirit to know how to quicken your body. I have seen many people who say, Pastor, I like to pray. I like to pray, but it's always so difficult. Every time I start praying, I start sleeping. There is a willing mind, but there is a weakened body that needs to also understand how to tap into the Holy Spirit to, to be quickened. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So this is what it means. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, the Bible talks about the Lord forming man out of the dust of the ground and breathing into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. We all know that this is how man was formed and this is how man began to live. But in Genesis chapter 3 verse 19, let's read that together. After man sinned, this was God's pronouncement to man. Let's read it together. In the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and dust you shall return. So this was what happened to man after the fall. We never heard that Adam before the fall was a weak man. We never heard that Adam before the fall was a person who was incapacitated in any way. But when he sold his birthright to the devil, the Bible says a pronouncement was made by God that he will have to go in the sweat of his face to eat bread and to till the ground because he was taken out of dust and he will return to dust. Now, this is very important for us to understand. However, God in his infinite wisdom did not leave man in that state. And he sent his son. The Bible says the word was with God in John chapter 1 and verse 14. And that word became flesh. Became again. That is the use of flesh which meant body. That word flesh. Be, that, that word became flesh 
And the Bible says he dwells amongst men. And then he was able to reach out to men and was able to save men. Psalm 107 verse 17. The flesh, his son, is also known as the word. Psalm 107 verse 17. The Bible says, fools, let's read together. Fools, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities, were afflicted. Man, because of his transgression and because of his iniquity, was afflicted. Fools, because of their transgression and their iniquities, they are afflicted. Verse 18, 19, let's go now. He said, then they cried out, read it with me, it's on your screen. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble and he saved them out of their distresses. They cried out to the Lord in their trouble and he saved them out of their distresses. Verse 20, let's go together. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Now he has not stopped doing that. When Jesus came, even though he was the word personified, he healed by the power of the word. Everyone he spoke to, he said to them, rise and be healed. Rise, take up your bed and walk and so on and so forth. Go, your servant shall be healed. The word, the word, the word. That's why the centurion said, speak the word only and your servant will be healed. We live in a generation that is so, so fetish and so looking for something that we underplay the power of the word. When you hear the word of God and you believe the word of God, it has power in itself to create everything. Jesus said, God said, let there be light. And the Bible says, and there was light. There was no abracadabra to it. There was no motion to it. The word. We are in a generation that must go back to understanding the power of the word. He sent his word and his word healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Luke chapter 5 verse 17. The Bible says, as Jesus was speaking the word. The power of God was present to do what? To heal and to deliver. We must understand that if we want this body to be quickened, if we want this body to be healed, you must learn how to take the word and obey the word and believe the word. The more of the word of God you believe, the more of the word of God you take, faith in you rises. The Bible says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. When the word of God comes your way and you believe it, faith in you rises. When the devil is trying to attack your body, the faith in you will speak against that attack. This is how you continue to overcome and quicken your mortal body. The devil's first point of call, so easy to reach, is your body. He finds it so easy. He finds it almost impossible to get to your spirit man. But he can get to your body and if you let him, he will easily get to your soul. So what he needs to be, what you need to do is every time you suspect him coming to bring an affliction to your body, you rise up with the spirit of faith that has been ignited by the word. You rise up and speak against that onslaught of wickedness. And God will continue to give you victory. I say God will continue to give you victory. In the name of Jesus, the Bible says they cry to the Lord. They cry to the Lord in their trouble and he saved them out of their distress. When you, dis when you every time you declare, I am healed, I am saved, I am set free, I am strong. God begins to honor your word. When you say, I cannot pray, I cannot wake up, the devil fuels what you are saying. You give power to either God or the devil with whatever you say. God will not commit to your unbelief and he will not stop you from speaking it. The devil is waiting for you to speak it. The angels are waiting. The Holy Spirit is waiting for you to speak the right things. Whatever you speak, one of them will pick it up. Every time you speak against the word of God, you incapacitate, in quote, the Holy Spirit and the angels. They can do nothing about it. He said, declare so that you can be justified. He didn't say, confess your situation. In fact, he said, let the weak say, I am strong. He said, let the weak say, I am strong. He said, let the poor say, I am rich. The devil will say, don't say that. That's for those people who have gone spiritually. That's for those people who are called pastors. Somebody say bishop. <laughs> you say you have no title. You should not speak like that. Ah, you, want, you want to die? 
Just say you are weak. You know yourself. Just say you are weak. You are weak. No, no, no. You say no. The Bible say, let the weak say, I am strong. I declare that I am strong. He said, let them say, that. let the poor say, I am rich. I declare that I am rich. Stop talking lack. Stop talking those things that the devil wants you to talk. Stay with God and speak the mind of God and watch God continue to perform the things that you say. I say God will perform the things that you say. In the name of Jesus. Friends, it is God's will consistently that we enjoy divine health. We read this very much in John, 3 John chapter 2. He said, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul is prospering. This was one of the scriptures Pastor Keith read with us on Monday night, last Monday when we were praying after the fasting. He, your soul is prospering, but he wants you to be in health. He wants you to prosper. He wants you to be in health. It is so important you understand. When you know what God wants for you, you live your life in conformity to that desire of God. It is not knowing what God wants for you that makes you dilly-dally, that makes you dither, that makes you wonder, is God for me? Is God not for me? I was only 10 years old when I realized that God loves me. I was getting baptized in April 1979 in a church in Greeley, Colorado. By the grace of God, I'll be there again very soon just to go and see and to thank God for the very great transformations he gave my life in that place. And the pastor was preaching. I was very young, but he was a man who was, he loved me very much. And he saw some, I believe he saw some potential in me. So he took me out of the park of the many children in the church. And he began to mentor me. He was a Baptist minister, but you know, he, he taught me the word of God and he showed me that God loved me just from John 3, 16. He told me, he said, I am fixed in that people called the world. And the Bible says he so loved. And I began to think if out of at that time, maybe four or five billion people at that time on the planet, if out of all those people, God could single me out and love me, it changed my mindset. You parents here would know that when you tell a child that they are loved, and you tell them almost every time that they are loved, those children are always very different. When a child knows that they are loved, they go with confidence everywhere they go. Anything anybody says to them, you say, I'll tell my father. I'll tell my father. I'll make sure I let my father know. Hallelujah. Because as far as that child is concerned, father can solve every problem. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. That is how you should be boasting to the devil. You say, devil, I will tell my father. You are, co you are causing trouble around me. I am reporting you to my father. When you live like that, what you are doing is you are engracing God. When everybody was looking at Goliath and they were shouting, one who knows that God was on their side, said, who is this person? Not defying the Israelites. He didn't say who is defying the Israelites. He didn't say who is defying David and his brothers. He didn't say who is defying the people of, of the land. He said who is this uncircumcised Philly, Philistine that is defying the armies of the living God. The heavens open. The moment you speak against the devil in the line with the word of God, you enforce the power of God to give you. His prayer for you is that you may prosper in all things and be in health, just as your soul prosper. May you continue to prosper in all things. May you continue to be in health in the name of Jesus. Friends, it is almost impossible to do your God-given tasks without good health. It's almost impossible. And I'm saying this with every sense of reverence. I know that we are attacked from time to time, and I, and I know that the devil never leaves us in that area. He tries to make people ill. He tries to make people sick and weak. But I want you to know that it's God's good intention. Don't say that, no, I don't believe I can get over this again. No. God, who has always let his word heal and deliver, will never leave you nor forsake you. In the name of Jesus. If you are a weak person, you will find it very difficult to do to walk excellently. When you walk a little, you will be tired. It will be impossible to do ministry. I can tell you that effectively. Because you will be very tired. Every time you just feel tired. And every time you are feeling tired like that, it weakens your capacity to be alert. Jesus said, couldn't you just tarry with me just for one hour? Just for one hour. If you know that if you must pray, and until you stand up 
and walk around, even though we are on uh, uh, Zoom and we are not in a physical building. Stand up, carry your phone, and be walking around in your house. Walk up and down the steps. Don't sit on your bed and say you are praying. You say shakra ba 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 ba. After 20 minutes, <laughs> no, you carry your phone. That's why nobody is seeing you. You can put it on a video close, isn't it? Nobody is seeing you. Walk up and down your house, whatever will wake you up. If you must put your head in the shower and bring it out again and continue, <laughs> just keep going. Hallelujah. <laughs> this is warfare. This is how you do it. Then a time will come, you will not need to do all that drama again. The devil will leave you alone. But if you don't make the effort, he will tell you you can't do it. You will pray for five minutes, you will sleep for 55 minutes. And then when they say, amen, you say, amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. You must do everything you can to make sure that your body is quickened. I wonder where I would have been to the glory of God. I'm not making empty boasts here. But I wonder where I would have been if I don't have spiritual energy to do this work. When I hear people say they are busy, at times I look at them and I laugh. If you know what busy is, you will not be talking what you are talking. <laughs> you want to know definition of busy? Come and see me. I will tell you what it means to be busy. When you are running three meetings at a time, one online, one by chat, another one physically, that they are looking at you, then you will know what it means to be busy in this day and age. You need to have an energized body to do this work. My God will quicken your motor body. I say, my God will quicken your mortal body. In the name of Jesus, if there is any infirmity in you that is defying the presence of God, I decree today that God will give you total healing. God will give you divine health. In the name of Jesus. Two ways of walking in divine health. As we pray these prayers, let's do these things. The first thing is that we need to know the place of kingdom service. This is the love of God. Exodus chapter 23 and verse 23, starting from verse 23. Let's read together. It said, For my angel will go before you and bring you to the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hevites and the Jebusites, and I will cut them off. This is God speaking now. He brought the children out, gave them the, of, of Egypt, gave them the Ten Commandments, told them, that they just need to be going to the land he's going to show them. He said, but the angel that will lead them will take them through the land of these mighty people. But he said, I will cut them off. It's very important we realize that. Go to verse 24. Read together now. He said, you shall not bow down to their gods. Don't compromise to the standards. He said, nor serve them, nor do according to their works, but you shall what? Utterly overthrow them and completely break down their sacred pillars. He said, you will continue to make sure that you don't follow their ways. A lot of believers are following worldly ways. And we must understand that God's standards have never changed. Yes, we live in a modern time. Yes, we live in a techno world. This, a lot of this technology did not exist when Jesus was speaking. In fact, almost all of it did not exist. But the truth of the matter is that it has not changed the compromise of the fight. It has not compromised the standard of the word of God that we must continue to follow God's standards and God's standards alone. He said, don't follow the way of the Hittites. Don't follow the way of the Perizzites. Don't follow the way of the Jebusites. Verse 25. He says, so, let's read together now. So you shall serve the Lord your God and he will bless your bread and water and I will take sickness away from the midst of you. The first thing he does is that he makes sure that whatever you eat is blessed. Many things that cause sickness today is as a result of what we ingest. And many of us do not understand the place when we want to eat and we just say, bless this food, O Lord, and give it in Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> you don't know what you are missing when you just rush over it to eat it. Bless it. Bless it. Say, Lord, I declare this food blessed and sanctified. If there is food poisoning, I'm not saying you should go and look for food poisoning and just eat it anyhow. You say, Pastor David, say, I can eat anything. I didn't tell you that kind of thing. But the truth of the matter is that when you are served food, you don't know what it is. You don't know who's prepared it. You don't know whether there's been an error. You don't know anything. Just bless it. If the Holy Spirit says you don't eat it, don't say it is blessed, I must eat. You argue with the Holy Spirit? No. 
So say, Holy Spirit, I've blessed it. He told you, don't eat it. He said, I've blessed it. <laughs> no, when he said to you, don't eat it, just put it aside, take a drink, do something else. I've, I've had a few instances like that. I don't know why. He just said, don't touch it. Don't touch it. And I just find a way to just push it away from me. And I take something else and I go. But I realize that it can be life-saving. Now, but anytime you must have faith to understand that when he said he will bless your bread and water to make you understand that even the things you ingest, if you serve him diligently, when you bless it, he blesses it to make sure that sickness does not come to you. And if for any reason he said that there is sickness, he said he himself would take that sickness away from the midst of you. I decree that he will keep taking sickness away from you. I say God will keep taking sickness away from you. In the name of Jesus. The second thing is that we ought to be benevolent. We should have the love of our neighbors. We should know that the two commandments that Jesus gave in Matthew 22, we read. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. And you shall love. The second is like unto it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. When you love God and you love people, you allow God to work on your health. When you love God, he commits to divine health for you. When you love people, he also commits to divine help. Look at Psalms 41, especially people who are in need, people who are vulnerable. Psalm 41, verse 1. Let's read together. He said, blessed is he who considers the poor. The Lord will do what? Deliver him in the time of trouble. Hallelujah. I said, the Lord will deliver you. I said, the Lord will deliver you. You know why the Lord delivers the one who considers the poor? Because God does not want anyone to be poor. God does not want anyone to be helped. And God cannot come down and give the poor money. He cannot come down and help the poor pay their school fees. He cannot come down and help the poor to have food to eat. He would not come and do those things. He uses agents. He uses people like you and I. And that is why the Bible says such people who make themselves available are blessed. Because they are considering the poor. And then God now commits to delivering them out of trouble. Praise the Lord. When a believer lives an insular life, me, myself, and I, my family, my, if I, at times, not, some people don't even consider family. They are so, so selfish, so self-centered. It's just me, myself, and I. When they say, how are you? You say, I, myself, me, are fine. <laughs> Nothing they ever think about anybody else. When they live like that, you make yourself vulnerable. You make yourself, you position yourself in a place where it becomes very difficult for God to even act on your behalf. When you're a person that is always reaching out and flowing out and always considering others, I know that you can't solve all the problems of this world, but do what you can. Do what you can. It was Roosevelt that said that just do what you can with what you have right where you are. It's so important. You change the world that way. Whatever you have, five pounds today is what you have. Do it. Do it. It can change a life. It can change a life and, and affect a soul. And when you live like that, the Bible says you are blessed. The Lord will deliver you out of all troubles. The Lord will preserve him and keep him alive. He will be blessed on the earth. He will not deliver him to the will of his enemies. These are divine uh, injunctions that protect us in many cases. Many of us do not understand these secrets. When you are committed to the things that God wants you to be committed to, there is a way God commits to your matter. I am never afraid, and I say this to the glory of God, and not in any way boasting uh, aimlessly about this, but in my God. I am never afraid of what man can do to me. Believe me, I am never afraid of it because I realize that there is a force that fights for me that is more than what meets the eye. So when you try to come and headbutt me, you are headbutting that force. I just stay where I am. I commit you to that God that I serve and watch him. He, look at what he said. He said, he will not deliver me to the will of my enemies. That is how he will preserve you as well. I said, that is how he will preserve you as well. Don't join the rat race at work. Don't do the things that they do, the schisms, the fight, the things that they do. Pull this one down, push that one down. Speak. Every opportunity you have to put in a good word for somebody, keep using it. Believe me, you keep doing it. When you live like this, there is a way you get heavenly insurance that God protects you and preserves you from falling. He preserves you from losing the things that everybody else is losing. Now, I know that the workplace can be very complicated. Some people make things difficult. But you know something? Keep using the biblical principles. Keep using spiritual principles and watch God fight on your behalf. I say God will fight for you. I say God will fight for you. 
in the name of Jesus. Let's shout verse 3 together. Psalm 41 verse 3. The Lord will strengthen him on his bed of sickness. You will sustain him on his sick bed. That is the man who is considerate of his neighbor. Who is considerate of the vulnerable. Who is considerate of the weak. Let us not lose sight of these things. Some of us have aged parents. And we don't even think about them. We don't even remember them. These are some people who, who worked so hard when we were young and in our diapers. These are people who labored very hard. I remember when I was in my final year, I needed to do a school project. This was in the year 1988. I just started, I was going to finish in 89. We just started the session in September, October. And they gave us a list of the things I needed to buy to do the lab experiments. I wanted to do something on hydraulic pipes and flows and stuff like that using bamboo shoots. And my father drove to the... I said, I don't know where I can get bamboo. And my father drove 700 kilometers. Because of his son, he went to the bush, cut down the bamboo. He said, we have them a lot in the farm at home. He went down right to our village, cut those bamboo shoots, and he brought them, and he put them in the boot of his car, and he drove to my university. And I saw him when I, I saw, he didn't tell me he was doing all that. There were no telephones those days, so I didn't even know he was coming. He just appeared. He said, I brought some things for you. I said, what's that, dad? He said, I brought some things from your, for, your, for your final year project. And uh, I, I said, what are they? And he opened the boot of his car. And I saw those one meter length of bamboo shoes that he had cut. He said, I hope this would help you do your experiments. I had tears. I felt tears almost coming out of my eyes that this man drove almost 1,000 kilometers total just because of my experiment. I said to him, Dad, as long as I live, you will not suffer. I don't know why I was just about 19 years old. I said, Dad, as long as I live by the grace of God, you will not suffer. For this thing that you have done today, it touched my heart. And then he wrote a check for me. The check was almost half, if I, total of his salary, believe me. When I looked at it, I said, this is, I know his salary. I said, this is your salary. He said, don't worry, I've discussed with your mom because you need this money and we want to get it through. Now, if an earthly father can do that for an earthly son, how much more your father in heaven, who is willing to make sure that you succeed, who is willing to make sure that he commits to you. Now, when we have parents like that, we only do ourselves a lot of favor by helping them even in their own old age, as much as God helps us. And I pray that God will keep giving us capacity to do that in the name of Jesus. So being benevolent is very important. It doesn't have to be family members alone. Many times I pay people school fees that I, I've never even seen. I'm not boasting. I'm telling you what I do so that you can do it. It's in line with the word of God. I pay people school fees. I do things. I give people money for their marriage and things. People I don't even know. People I, I just met a bit. And things like that. And they, they have that dire need. And we do it. And I find that the more you do it, the more God commits not only to your health, even to your wealth. He makes sure there is no... The Bible says the liberal soul shall be made fat. If you are flowing out, God keeps putting in. Because God will not want you to be empty. You are a conduit. God will continue to grant us wisdom. In the name of Jesus. If you want to live in divine health, these are some principles. They are not my words. Go and read the scripture. And practice it. We must thus remain in the fear of God. So that we can partake of this ultimate resurrection. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 verse 6. The Bible says remember now. Your creator before the silver cord is loosed. Or the golden bowl is broken. Or the pitcher shattered at the fountain. Or the wheel broken at the well. Verse 7 says then the dust will return to the earth as it was. And the spirit will return to God who gave it. There is a day that this carcass, this skin, will become carcass again. And we must understand that while we good, must take good care of it, make sure that it is clothed, make sure that it is washed regularly. I believe you do that anyway. Make sure that, you know, you take care of it. Don't lose focus of the fact that one day it's just going to be waste. It's going to return to the dust from whence it came. And the spirit, much more. We go to God who gave it. This is what Hebrews 9.27 tells us that that is the judgment. God is coming back, however, to give us a new body. A new frame of mind that will be very devoid of this kind of rottenness. The flesh that we have today will rot 
But the time is coming, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The Bible says, now this I say, brethren, that the flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So we are not going to heaven with this king. We are not going to heaven with this body. Nor does corruption inherit incorruption. He said, but I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, in the last trumpet. This is what the Bible makes us to understand and we call the rapture, when Jesus will appear again. And every one of us, Paul, writing to the Thessalonians, he said the dead in Christ will rise first. And then those who are alive and remain will be caught up in the air. Then we shall be like him. We shall have a glorious body. This body will no longer be what we have. We shall be exactly like Jesus in his glorified form. The same way he was when he was resurrected and he went back to heaven is the same way we shall be. Let us look forward to those days. The Bible says, so in a moment, and uh, verse 53, he said, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Let's read verse 54 together. Everybody loud and clear. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Somebody shout hallelujah. When you understand this as a believer, death will no longer threaten you. You see, the day you understand that death is not the end for you as a believer, that very day you will no longer fear death. I'm not saying you should live carelessly anyhow, but know what? You have no reason to fear death. One, you cannot die before your time. I say you will not die before your time. I say you will not die before your time. But when your time is up and when you do ultimately go, death will be swallowed up in victory because this corrupt and mortal being of yours will put on incorruption and it will put on immortality. In the name of Jesus, let these words continue to encourage you on a daily basis. For Christians, death is not the end. Death is life. Death is the pathway to eternal life, to its fullness. So never let the devil ever scare you with death again. Anytime you want to go and embark on something and the devil says, you know, this thing has killed many people. Don't go and try it. Don't go and do it. <laughs> you tell the devil, I shall not die, but I shall do what? Live to declare the works of God. And anytime God calls me home, my, my body, my mortal body will be quickened to put on immortality and I shall be like him forever in the name of Jesus. This is how we ought to be in our fight of faith. I need to bring this to a close, even though I could still easily go for one more hour. But I'll bring it to a close because I know that there is a lot for us to look into these matters. I talked about the spiritual flesh. I will not be able to go on, on it today. But I will, by the grace of God, pick it up as we go on in the course of the week. The spiritual flesh just refers to that part of our body where the devil easily makes us to fall into sin. This has nothing to do with weakness, feeling tired. It's a very different thing. The spiritual state of our flesh is where sin resides. That is what the Bible calls the fruit of the flesh. In that Matthew 26 we read, I must leave, leave you on that because it was a scripture we read. In verse 51, the Bible says that when one of those who were with Jesus struck, stretched out his hand and drew the sword, he struck the servant of the high priest, cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, put your sword in its place. For all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Somebody was trying to fight a physical fight and Jesus said to him, that is sin. Don't do that. Those who fight by the sword will die by the sword. You need to be spiritual. You need to understand that it is not a fight of flesh and blood. This is how your skin, this is how your flesh must continue to embrace the spiritual victory that God has given it. Not by trying to fight physical, but understanding that there is a spiritual weapon in your flesh that can help you to overcome the challenges that want to put you into sin. The fruit of the flesh, the Bible talks about them in many cases. He said that in verse um, uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, he said, Therefore, since we also surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. These things fight in our flesh. 
Everybody must understand what their flesh is subjected to. You must understand it. Don't deceive yourself. God knows it. There's no point trying to hide it from him. And what you need to do is to help yourself against those things. If you are trying to stop gossip and you have friends that make you gossip and just talk about others and talk about others and talk about others, delete yourself from that group. Who told you that you must go there? Don't say they will miss you. No, they will not miss you. <laughs> they will not miss you. Gossip can be a very bad thing. Remember those preachers? Three of them. They were having a row and uh, they were very open. They said, let's let our hair down, confess to each other, you know, the weaknesses. One of them said, my problem is women. When I see women, my knees just buckle. And then the other one said, oh, no, that's too bad. The other one said, my problem is money. That if you bring money my way like this, I will grab it before it, it reaches the offering, <laughs> the bank account. <laughs> and then the third one shook his head. He said, what is your problem? You don't want to talk? He said, my problem is gossip. <laughs> I'm even waiting now. Let us get out of this boat. I just want to go and tell everybody what you have said. <laughs> So they wish he spoke first because if he was the first one to speak, nobody would say anything. Again. <laughs> so gossip is not a good thing at all. But the truth of the matter is that that's a joke. But the truth of the matter is that don't joke with the things. If you are weak around the opposite sex, don't take it lightly. Don't play with it. It will pull you down one day. If you are weak with the things that uh, others find easy to overcome, like alcohol and uh, drunkenness, and you know that it's been a problem before. Don't hang around with people that drink. It will take you again one day. This is how you deal with the fruit of the flesh. It talks about adulteries. It talks about surmises. It talks about outbursts of anger. Go and read it in Galatians chapter 5. Time will fail me today to go into this very aspect. But it's so important. You quicken your mortal body by allowing the Holy Spirit to help you. But one of the ways the Holy Spirit helps you is to give you wisdom. To know what to do, how to do, to know where to go, how to go, to know what to say, how to say, and how not to be a partaker of the things that the devil wants you to put in your flesh. The Bible says, let us lay it aside. I pray the grace of God upon you to lay aside every sin, to lay aside every weight. In the name of Jesus. I know I said I have to stop, but I, I'm finding it very difficult. 1 Corinthians 9, 27, Paul said, I put my body under. I put it in subjection. This your flesh wants to be over. It wants to control you. Whether the physical body demanding for sleep, demanding for food when you want to fast, demanding for things, making you want to lust when you, don't, when you are keeping your focus, demanding for things that want to keep you under and eat over you have to take that body and put it under put it under your spirit man and keep commanding it you have been delivered you have been set free when you live like that you not only live a life that glorifies god you also live a life of peace because the same flesh that you succumb to and leads you to sin is the same place the devil will come and suggest to you that you see you have fallen again and then you live in guilt for a long time even to pray will be difficult these are spiritual truths that believers have toyed with over time. And I pray that God will continue to raise us a strong army in this place. I pray that God will continue to raise us a strong army in this place. In the name of Jesus. Let's rise to our feet. Where